Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, a rare miss for Facebook. The company reported weaker than expected revenue and monthly and daily active users in its second quarter results. Plus, on the heels of Facebook's results, investors gave a thumbs down to several tech peers in post market trading. Will negative sentiment infect the sector? And Qualcomm terminates its deal to acquire NXP, bringing an end to a nearly two year saga. We'll discuss where the chipmaker goes from here. But first to our top story, Facebook shares tanked in after hours trading after a lackluster second quarter report. It is the first sign Facebook is indeed seeing user disenchantment in the midst of public scandals over privacy and content. In a very rare occurrence, the tech giant missed analyst estimates on revenue for the first time since 2015. Investors seem to be shocked that the social platform's skyrocketing ad revenue is not continuing. Facebook also missed on both monthly and daily active users. Daily active users remain the same in the United States and at 185 million and declined in Europe from 282 million to 279 million. Joining us now from New York, we have Techonomy CEO and our Bloomberg contributing editor, David Kirkpatrick. Also with us, we have Melissa Parrish of eMarketer. Melissa, what do you think the biggest headline is here? I think the biggest headline is exactly what you said. Actually, the fact that uh, it, it, Facebook has missed for the first time in in quite some time. Uh, although I would say that in my world, an 11% year-over-year increase for active users, both daily and monthly, is still a win. Uh, so the headline is is perhaps a little different than my own interpretation of the numbers. And look, David, they missed on all of these metrics, but not by a lot. Are investors overreacting? Well. It is a historic day because I think it's a sign of a turn, but I would also agree with Melissa, revenue is up 42% year over year. This company is not hurting, but they did disappoint vis-a-vis -vis expectations, and that in itself is historic. And I think actually probably it's healthy for the company to see their results get criticized because it'll force them to take these problems they're in the midst of even more seriously and perhaps be more candid with how they're addressing them because I don't think they've been very candid, although some of the results suggest they're spending even more than we thought trying to remediate it, which is good. Now, we've got some great commentary happening right now on Bloomberg's top live blog. My colleague Shira Oviday uh, asking the perennial question, has Facebook reached the end of new users? Are there just no more new users for Facebook? Melissa, what do you think? Well, I think uh, I think that's a very fair question to ask. They are at 30% of the world's population. There will be a ceiling at some point. I don't think they're there quite yet, though, because though we know that a sentiment and interest among the youngest users uh, has not been as strong as for previous generations, uh, I think there's still a lot of room for growth there. There are an awful lot of young people in the world who have have yet to get on Facebook. David, how much does this have to do, you think, with the scandals, with concerns over data privacy? Well, it's funny because as you asked that last question to Melissa about growth being, you know, no longer possible, which I, I, I think it occurred to me, look, there's still plenty of more people to come onto Facebook. But we know, for example, in India, people are flocking onto Facebook right now, so that if, in fact, growth is slowing globally, it could mean that even more people are coming off in some of the more developed countries or slowing their usage. And that could be significant because those are the users that are the most profitable for Facebook at the moment. Um, but there is a massive underserved, still unserved community of people in the billions in the developing world that want Facebook, that will get Facebook. Growth has not ended for Facebook. But again, this is a historic shift. Things are not as good as they were, and that is significant. I want to talk about Instagram. Facebook still doesn't break down Instagram revenue, but according to the estimates, continuing um, to grab a bigger share of that ad revenue pie, continuing to grab more users. Uh, Melissa, eMarketer, saying Instagram will generate $8.06 billion in ad revenue this year, giving it 3% of the total digital ad market in the world. That's 
that's kind of huge, isn't it? <laughs> it is kind of huge. I, I can't speak to eMarketer's numbers. I know that at Forrester we forecast something similar. Um, I would say this is this is not surprising though when you look at a couple of other trajectories that are that are trending. For example, we know that internet usage has been moving mobile uh, on a global scale for the past many years. And one of the other really interesting numbers I thought uh, about Facebook's earnings was that 91% of their ad revenue is now uh, coming from mobile. Uh, so I mean, the, the the portion of the pie is continuing to grow as well. Uh, I think we will see that shift a bit as other uh, rivals and uh, whether you're talking about the advertising space or social media start to uh, shift more towards mobile as well. Uh, but I do think that uh, Instagram is is capturing a large portion of those mobile dollars because of their innovation in their ad products and uh, core product as well. Now, David, at a certain point, could Instagram start outshining Facebook or become an actual threat to Facebook you for, for Facebook? Yeah. You foreshadowed what I was just about to say. I think Instagram is doing so well and seems so well suited to the psychology of the modern internet user compared to Facebook, which is really a somewhat dated conceptual framework. You know, it's a, a what is it, a 13 and a half year old product. Um, and, and I, I think, frankly, uh, Instagram could really be, become the, the core of this company down the road. Uh, somebody I heard earlier was saying maybe they should spin it off and make it a separate company because that's where the future lies. Uh, Facebook core, Facebook is still a very healthy business despite today's news. But yes, Instagram may be a key part of the company's future. It's brilliant of them that they bought it. It's worth hundreds of billions now. They paid a billion for it. Now, on that note, Mark Zuckerberg opened the conference call talking about a new metric, saying for the first time they're releasing the number of people who use at least one Facebook app, 2.5 billion people every month. So that's Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, WhatsApp. Is this new metric, Melissa, something that you think counts? I do think it's something that counts because I think the idea that they are truly diversifying in terms of the products that they offer the marketplace is important, uh, largely because of what David was saying. This is a very strong business. Nobody's saying that it isn't. But the more we look at the different products that make up their portfolio, the stronger that I think the picture becomes in terms of long-term growth. So I really like this metric. I like that we're not lumping every user into, uh, into the core product or assuming that that's what it means. All right, Melissa Parrish of Forrester, uh, David Kirkpatrick of Techonomy. David, you're going to be sticking with me. Uh, Zuckerberg also attributing that dip in users in Europe to GDPR. We're going to be covering Facebook more throughout the show. PayPal stock fell in after hours trading after the payments giant's third quarter revenue forecasts were projected below analyst estimates. But as for its just announced second quarter, payments volume was up 5% for the second quarter and added 7.7 .7 million customers. Earnings per share came in at 58 cents versus 57 cent estimates, and net revenue was $3.86 billion against estimates of 3.81. This comes only days after Dan Loeb of Third Point raved about the company. Coming up, we will turn to the chip makers. Qualcomm CEO says it's terminating its plans to buy rival NXP after the deal was held up by Chinese regulators. CEO Steve Mollenkopf spoke to NXP on the earnings call. Take a listen. The decision for us to move forward without NXP was a difficult one. Continued uncertainty overhanging such a large acquisition introduces heightened risk. We weighed that risk against the the likelihood of a change in the current geopolitical environment, which we didn't believe was a high probability outcome in the near future. Qualcomm has announced it is abandoning its $44 billion bid to acquire rival NXP in what would have been the largest ever deal in the chip industry. This after Chinese regulators held up approval amid rising trade tensions with the United States. The news came as Qualcomm released its earnings. The company also outlined its plan to buy back nearly $30 billion or so worth of shares. For more, we're joined by Romain Bostic, editor of the Top Live blog for Bloomberg News. And in Washington, we have Isaac Stonefish, senior fellow at the Asia Society. Romain, I'll start with you. This is a blow to both companies. How big a blow? 
Well, it's a blow in the sense that Qualcomm had banked a lot of its future uh, on a merger with NXP, and now that that's not happening, uh, you know, there's going to be some questions, I think, long term about what the future of Qualcomm is and how it's going to be able to grow. Of course, as you mentioned, it did sort of cushion the blow today uh, with that stock buyback announcement, uh, but that probably will only sort of give a temporary boost to the stock until uh, we get a little bit more clarity from management on what they can do. As far as NXP, I mean, it's a little bit more murky. Uh, because no one's quite sure exactly what options they have uh, other than going it alone, uh, particularly in the environment that we're in. So unless some of the, the rhetoric here on the U.S. side uh, between the U.S. and China uh, changes in the next few months, uh, I think that both companies are going to sort of have to go uh, on sort of solo paths, if you will. NXP certainly has a tough job ahead convincing investors. It has a strong future as an independent company. Um, Qualcomm CEO Steve Mollenkopf uh, said today, we didn't see an end to the process or near end to the process, so we had to move on. There were probably bigger forces at play here mm -hmm. than just us. We are still big fans of the deal, still fans of the deal and the logic behind it. So Isaac, he, he's certainly there uh, implying that uh, the trade tensions between the U.S. and China had something to do with this. Uh, Chinese regulators are as far as Bloomberg has been reporting, were on track to approve this deal, but did not. You know, they didn't say no either. What should we read into it? So the CEO did say, I think roughly a week ago in the New York Times, that, yeah, I think trade tensions have something to do with this deal being held up. And I got to say, this is a very classic Beijing strategy. They didn't deny the deal. They didn't block it. No official statement saying that this deal is not going to go forward. They just let the deadline expire. I guess we're, what, six hours away, six and a half hours away from the deadline. And they just said, OK, we're just going to let this one go. And it gives them plausible or somewhat plausible deniability when they're having this conversation. They could say, oh, yeah, we didn't have enough information from Qualcomm. We didn't have this. We didn't have that. This is not part of the trade tensions. And if they do make that point with the U.S. side, it allows them to say, listen, like we, we're blameless on this. You guys have to make other concessions. Romain, how big a shadow does this cast over potential deals in the chip industry? This after, um, you know, President Trump essentially blocked that um, acquisition of Qualcomm by Broadcom. Yeah, I mean, there's a pretty clear message, I think, coming out of the administration here that really any sort of mergers, particularly cross-border mergers, are, are going to be scrutinized, not in the context of uh, whether it's good business, but really in the context of uh, the trade war and whether it's good politics. Uh, you saw some of the comments from Qualcomm today sort of alluding to that and, that, and for the reason that they wanted to walk away. I think it's going to give a lot of companies pause uh, going Going forward, because you you're not really navigating sort of antitrust issues and some of the more traditional issues you would have to deal with with regulators. This is really about uh, how does your merger fit into sort of the uh, new policy initiatives by the United States government, and does it conflict? Uh, with what they're trying to do and exerting their influence uh, over their trading partners. Now, the blocking of that Broadcom Qualcomm deal is something that Qualcomm wanted, but Isaac has, you know, President Trump inadvertently hurt an American company, Qualcomm, as a result of this quote unquote America first strategy. It certainly wouldn't be the first time. I think there's a lot of frustration among American companies about the way that trade tensions are going and about tariffs on Chinese goods. It slows down their business. It makes it harder for them to deliver products to their consumers. And American companies do not have the same obsession with the trade imbalance that Trump does. You know, Trump, Navarro, other people at the top of his administration feel really strongly about rectifying a trade imbalance, but most of the serious economists out there and business people out there don't feel that that's the problem in terms of doing business with China. They're a lot more interested in intellectual property issues and market access issues. They don't really care about the trade imbalance. Now, Qualcomm, Romaine, has some other big problems. I mean, its stock is on its way to its third uh, year of, of annual declines, and also it's in this big standoff 
with Apple in various disputes around the world. Yeah, that's sort of getting overshadowed. I mean, the stock's down about 8% this year uh, before today. Uh, you know, you consider that the rest of the semiconductor space uh, was up about 9% so far this year. So it's really lagged, and that's really because of the fundamental issues that are still plaguing this company. Something that, frankly, I, I don't think I saw a lot of discussion about uh, out of the release. Um, they're getting some questions about that on the call. Uh, but this is something that I think once um, the sort of the uh, euphoria over the buyback dies down, uh, investors are going to have to reassess. Um, is the growth still there, the organic growth still there for this company? Can they resolve some of the issues that they're having with Apple? Right now, those questions are still out there. All right. Bloomberg's Romain Bostic and Isaac Stonefish from the Asia Society. Of course, we will continue to follow. Coming up, Facebook's second quarter was lackluster, but what does that tell us about how users value their privacy on the social media site? We will discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Facebook out with second quarter results, and for the first time since 2015, the social media giant missed top line estimates as data scandals piled up. This comes at a time when Pew Research, a Pew Research study, shows that the majority of U.S. adults say they don't have confidence that social media companies will adequately protect their data. And yet, Forrester Research says that while users knew of the Cambridge Analytica data scandal, they didn't change their usage patterns because of it. Still with us in New York, we have Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick. And here with me in the studio, we have David Gorodiansky, CEO and founder of Anchor Free, a software privacy company whose VPN app Hotspot Shield counts 600 million users. So, David, we have conflicting information here about how much users actually care about privacy and these new results from Facebook showing that user engagement is decreasing. You know, how much do people actually care about whether or not Facebook is responsible with their data? We see that people are starting to care a lot more now than they did several years ago. As a matter of fact, we just surveyed our users and found that most of our users said that about 70% of the time they don't mind uh, sharing stuff on Facebook and they, they're not that concerned about their privacy, but about 30% of the time almost everybody said that they're very concerned about their privacy and that 30% is when it comes to things like your health, your wealth, uh, your family. And those are the things that people are concerned about and they want to protect and they really are looking for simple solutions to protect their digital lives. Uh, when privacy does matter to them. You come from a world that is always skeptical of how companies are, are, are handling our information. Do you think we should be suspicious of Facebook? You know what my biggest concern is with Facebook? It's not so much even that they share our data with advertisers. Is They're not only selling our data, they're also still buying data. So if you're on some other website doing a search on Google or something, that information all of a sudden could be sold to Facebook. And they, they add that to your profile and they collect more and more information that you never actually explicitly gave them. That's the biggest concern. Everybody's so focused on Facebook selling data, but everybody's ignoring the fact that they're buying your data from all these other sources. And it's really not just Facebook. It's, um, there's basically a number of corporations, governments, and of course hackers that have a lot to gain from exploiting our data. And it's really time for consumers to take control over their privacy and security into their own hands. Consumers and businesses both. So you're talking about a number of different issues that actually came up uh, in Mark Zuckerberg's congressional testimony. Lawmakers asked him about this. And, and David Kirkpatrick, you know, indeed, Facebook is doing a lot of other things aside from just selling Facebook to advertisers, aside from just renting our data, essentially, to advertisers. But do you think that this... Uh, this, this drop in users, this, this plateau that we may be seeing, is this just a blip or is this a longer term trend? That's, that's a $64,000 question, Emily. I, I don't think there's any reason to think we have seen a fundamental shift toward a new long term trend. I mean, it's really a decline in rate of growth. Um, 
I do think in the developed countries and even in some of the key developing countries like India, which is growing, but where these issues matter, the issue of privacy, the issue of how much data Facebook has and how it treats that data is extremely of concern among consumers. And I don't think the company's done a well, a good enough job explaining to people how they really think about the data. I think the GDPR um, problem in Europe that really apparently has affected uh, the number of the users there, at least in a minimal way, but genuinely, uh, it may be a sort of signal of where we're going to go elsewhere because I think other countries are going to impose rules that are not that dissimilar to GDPR or they're going to expect that kind of treatment of their data anyway. So I'm. I think Facebook has to change the way they relate to their users, and they're starting to do it, but not fast enough. Um, BuzzFeed published a memo from uh, the, the Facebook security chief, Alex Stamos, who was on his way out the door talking about how uh, we need to build a user experience that conveys honesty and respect, not just optimize to get clicks. David, you know, Hotspot Shield has some interesting data uh, about spikes in uses around things like the target breach, the iCloud hack, uh, the U.S. presidential election. But how do you think user behavior around privacy is actually going to change? Is this something that users are, are going to pay for? You know, we've seen or that a they're going to expect for free? I think that uh, people, some people are willing to pay for privacy, some people expect it for free. What we're seeing is in the U.S. about two years ago, privacy was something that only sort of the tech technology geeks really cared about. Today it's gotten really mainstream to a point that if you look in the Apple App Store and you look at the top 50 most popular apps, you'll see Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and others. And Hotspot Shield from Anchor Free is among the top 50 and we're the only privacy and security related product on the list in the U.S. and it just signals that millions of U.S. consumers have found that security and privacy is important to them and uh, it's really gone from something that was pretty niche to being something that's really mainstream. By the way, we're seeing the same trend with businesses. More and more businesses are realizing that their data is on Facebook, their data is all over the internet and they're looking to protect their data and the data of their employees. Is Hotspot Shield more than just a VPN? Hotspot Shield is more than just a VPN. Hotspot Shield um, basically protects against a number of different online threats. One is it anonymizes your IP address, a unique number that your internet service provider assigns to you and uses it to track you across the web. Two, it encrypts public Wi-Fi if you're connecting to the web at an airport or at a Starbucks. It secures that connection. Three, it blocks phishing and malware sort of like an antivirus application, but it is a lot more robust and actually works very well on mobile. Quickly, uh, David Kirkpatrick, is this something you see actually taking, taking on more broadly among U.S. and global users? Well, I, I think the thing that is gaining a lot of interest in the tech industry and that could appeal to users is this idea that they should be somehow concretely paid for their data instead of having it just taken from them and used to target advertising to them. And there is an extraordinary explosion in entrepreneurship and innovation, a, a lot of companies working on systems that might allow people to somehow, quote unquote, monetize their own data rather than have Facebook do it for them. And All I don't right. think it's inconsistent conceivable Facebook could do that too. Techonomy's David Kirkpatrick, Anchor Freeze, David Gorodiansky, thank you both. Thank you. Coming up, a question that's been asked for years and that we've been asking, is Facebook finally running out of new users? We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Things just don't seem as good as they once were for Facebook. For the first time since 2015, the tech giant missed estimates on revenue. Facebook also missed on both monthly and daily active users. Zuckerberg made mention to the decline of users in Europe and pointed to the new GDPR laws. Take a listen. GDPR was an important moment for our industry. We did see a decline in monthly actives in Europe, down by about 1 million people as a result. And at the same time, it was encouraging to see the vast majority of people affirm that they want us to use context, including from websites they visit, to make their ads more relevant and improve their overall product experience. 
Joining us now, James Wang, analyst at ARK Investment, and Martin Kremenstein, senior managing director at Nuveen. And Martin, you don't have a position in Facebook, and you do follow the company closely, though. How much does that have to do with the concerns about data and privacy? Yeah, so um, in our large cap growth uh, ETF uh, and NULG, we don't have a position in Facebook um, because it's ESG score, it's an ESG um, ETF. Its ESG score is actually relatively poor compared to the rest of the tech sector. Um, on its own, it has a, a, an all right ESG score, uh, but when you compare it to the rest of the tech, it actually didn't meet the cutoff to be included in the portfolio. Uh, and, and so what does that actually mean? So what that means is um, in terms of um, scores for environmental, social and governance compared to the rest of its peers, um, it scored poorly, and that was driven mostly by data privacy and security concerns, um, which caused it to be downgraded from a triple B rating to a double B by MSCI, um, I think back in March of, uh, of this year. Um, even prior to that downgrade, it, wouldn't, it didn't actually make the portfolio. The, the lowest grade within our tech sector of, of NULG is actually uh, a single A rating for, for ESG score. So, uh, James, what do you make of these latest results? It's a miss across the board, but it's not a huge miss. That's right. Um, by Facebook standards, it is quite a surprise because, as you noted, that uh, since they IPO, they've re really performed very, very reliably. Their MAU numbers are just like kind of a staircase to heaven. Their revenues uh, continue to grow at 40% plus. So this is a bit of a surprise, but I think it's important to have a bit of context. Um, Facebook has communicated that GDPR will have an impact, as the CFO indicated on the call, and it had precisely that impact. But heading into the close, Facebook's been trading at pretty much all-time highs, so um, Wall Street pretty much ignored that and assumed that everything was going to be uh, picture-perfect. It was a little bit less than picture-perfect, so I think that's why we're seeing the, uh, the, the red print. Martin, how much do you think this has to do with Cambridge Analytica, with concerns about trust, or is, is the market just saturated? Are there just not that many new users out there for Facebook? I think it's tough to really tell. I mean, when you look at their emerging markets, um, growth seems to be pretty strong there too. It's definitely slowed up uh, in North America, and obviously it's declined a little bit in Europe. Um, some of that is going to have been driven by Cambridge Analytica. Some of it's going to be driven by the fact that these markets are just a bit more mature. Um, I think uh, another interesting stat that came out was that their, um, their headcount is up significantly, and a lot of that is driven by user content moderation, and that has been driven partly by the Cambridge Analytica scandal, but also uh, by the, the, the issue issues around the spreading of so-called fake news. Um, and the question is, long term, what do those issues mean for the company? Does it dent profitability? Does it, offend the, does it dent the efficiency of the operating model? Well, and will it impact the rest of the sector, James? We saw strong earnings from Alphabet this week. We saw disappointing earnings from Netflix. We're always talking about whether the high that tech has been on will also continue or not. Uh, exactly. I think it's not. It's important not to lose sight of context here. Uh, Facebook is trading at pretty much all-time highs. With this a little bit of haircut, it is still in that range. And we had a few interesting metrics come out this quarter. One is that they're disclosing the number of unique users across all their platforms. That's 2.5 billion. I can count on my hand. I only need two fingers to count the number of companies that can boast those kind of metrics. And they're both two of the fan companies, Google and Facebook. And I think they will continue to have that very, very strong position. Instagram is almost certainly going to reach 2 billion users. Uh, and there are just about to turn on the monetization for WhatsApp and Messenger. So I think there is plenty of potential ahead uh, if you don't freak yourself out over one bad earning. Facebook at session lows down 17% in after hours trading and yet Instagram is the the shining light you know by all accounts and, and estimates that we see um, only uh, consuming a bigger piece of that digital ad pie Martin you know what about the rest of the sector you know you know we're still in the middle of earnings season you know we've seen uh, reports on both sides of the coin what's to come um, well, I, I can't say for certain. What I do know is that we've definitely had a massive run-up, um, and, and I think James is the right. Context is important. Most of these companies are still around all-time highs. Um, if they take a breather, they take a breather. Um, what's more important is looking at how the long-term operating models work, uh, and maybe maybe certain growth expectations need to be tempered. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be thrown out completely. Um, I, th I think context is really important at this point. Um, uh Facebook CFO Dave Weiner um, speaking on the call talked about what is driving such rapid deceleration in revenue growth. He talked about currency as a headwind. He talked about um, 
engaging new experiences like stories and giving people more choices around privacy. James, which of those stands out most to you? Um, I'm going to have to listen in a bit more detail, but I think video is the most obvious opportunity. I think Facebook's been pursuing that um, very, very uh, wisely. Uh, we did get some update that uh, Facebook Watch, which is their video program, is gaining some traction. They've been investing in original content there, so that's nice to see because that's where they have the most leverage. But um, IGTV, their, the Instagram video platform, is uh, that just launched maybe a month ago. I think that is, uh, is, is potential. I mean, that could become a one billion user platform. and. Being a video platform, you can rack up hours uh, of daily usage time, and that would be an incredible amount of runway. The, the global advertising industry for TV is still $200 billion large, and that would give Facebook plenty of room for growth. All right, uh, we'll continue to discuss. James Wang, ARK Investment Analyst, Martin Kremenstein of Nuveen. Thank you both. Well, SpaceX launched a batch of satellites for longtime customer Iridium Communications early on Wednesday. The Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from Vandenberg Air Force Base on the Central California coast. This was the 14th mission of the year for the company run by billionaire Elon Musk. SpaceX is hoping to launch at least 30 rockets in 2018. Coming up, we'll hear from Bloom Energy's CEO as the company hits the public market with shares spiking over 60% in its first day of trading. Why it is so rare for alternative energy companies to go public at all. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Manhattan office buildings and sprawling data centers can now get power without connecting to a utility grid. Bloom Energy is helping to make that happen. And this $270 million IPO means more cash to fund expansion. It's the first alternative energy IPO in the U.S. since October 2016 and the best first day debut of the past five years. Shares were up over 66% in its first day of trading. Bloomberg News deals and IPO reporter Alex Barinka reports. Imagine a future where anyone can be their own power provider. That's the reality that Bloom Energy CEO K.R. Sridhar set out 16 years ago to create. Now, he's selling that story to public market investors. Bloom Energy just began trading on the New York Stock Exchange Wednesday morning. We have a very simple value proposition. Number one, we are more reliable and resilient than the grid. Number two, we are cleaner than the grid. Number three, we save them money. Bloom sells what it calls energy servers. They're customizable systems that generate power for customers like Morgan Stanley and AT&T without the need to connect to a power plant. These high-tech boxes run on natural gas or biogas 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In the past five years, only 1% of American IPOs have been alternative energy companies. And it's been a year and a half since the last one went public. Clean tech had been riding a popularity high on the tail of the more than $100 billion the Obama administration piled into the industry. Under the Trump administration, enthusiasm for the space has faded, along with many of the government tax credits and other incentives for clean tech. Yet the reinstatement of an investment tax credit for fuel cells in the massive tax overhaul bill worked in Bloom Energy's favor. The cost of fuel cell projects has also declined as the systems have become more efficient. For years, Bloom had been racking up a huge deficit totaling $2.3 billion, but the company's financials are finally turning a corner. In the first three months of this year, revenue quadrupled compared to the same period in 2017 to $121 million. The world needs reliable electricity. We've gone from a mechanical age to a digital age, and we are a solution. An alternative energy company that's inching closer to profitability is a reality that public investors can get comfortable with. With us now, Bloomberg's Alex Barinka with more on Bloom Energy's IPO. What makes it so unique among other 
such companies that have had difficulties going public? It's a fuel cell company. So when you think of alternative energy, you think solar. And solar has been kind of the reason the whole industry has been dragged down. China's the biggest market for solar, and they ended their initiative in May. That's brought down the whole group. Fuel cells are a bit unique. Uh, it's not the same thing. They're complicated to put together. You saw those big boxes there. Um, but as you heard KR Sridhar say, the CEO, it does help with costs once customers do get them installed. So there's been this gap because the industry is down at a lull. Uh, folks may hope now that others might follow suit. Right. So will there be more? Hopefully. That is that is the, uh, the hope here. The issue is Trump seems to be talking a lot about coal. Uh, this investment tax credit that they have got reinstated for fuel cells was a bit of a luck in lobbying on Bloom's part. So we will see if we get more out of this part of the clean tech space finally listing. Uh, you also listened in to the Qualcomm call. We've been talking about uh, them walking away from this NXP deal. It's been a two-year saga. The Chinese government didn't actually say no. They just said nothing. And, you know, the deadline is now expiring. How, how, how much will this hurt uh, a U.S. company in what's supposed to be an America first environment. Uh, for a U.S. company, if you're only in the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, then you're not probably not going to have any issues. I think something that Qualcomm CEO Steve Molenkov said on the call was very revealing. He was asked whether this was an NXP issue or if this was a broader M&A issue. He said it's probably more of a sentiment about the overall macro environment. And he said he, they made this decision now because they don't expect relations with China to improve in the near term. So so they're going to walk away. So it seems like if you are uh, selling or buying, whether that's products or companies, into or out of China, you might have a bit of an issue here. And, you know, I also expect this might chill the m and market as a whole if you need a Chinese regulator sign off on any deal. Have NXP and Qualcomm become pawns in this global trade war? Uh, it seems like they kind of have. Uh, our sources told us uh, in the last month that the regulator in China has actually approved the deal, the announcement just hasn't come yet. So as we've seen this kind of back and forth, uh, this does seem to be a card that's being kept in the back pocket of the Chinese uh, pol political side. So the announcement could play. still come. Could still come. Could the deal be recovered? If if so, if we hear something before 11.59 p.m. Eastern time, mm. that is the uh, go, no-go end date there. So I will be watching my clock and mm. uh, hoping to But at to this hear. point, Qualcomm is prepared to pay that $2 billion breakup fee, um, the cost exactly. of divorce. All right, Alex Barinka, our Bloomberg IPO and deals reporter, thank you so much. Uh, coming up, tough 2018 just keeps getting tougher for Facebook. Shares plummeting after earnings down 22%. Zuckerberg making it clear that this is the year to turn the company around. Facebook second quarter earnings call still going on, and we will bring you all the latest headlines next. This is a critical year for Facebook. We've made progress preventing abuse, forged ahead with new innovations, and are adapting our services to the new trends, messaging, stories, videos, and groups. While tech companies like Google are well known for their extravagant campuses and benefits packages, not all workers are able to reap the rewards. Alongside thousands of direct employees, Google employs hordes of contractors, most of whom don't get those same benefits and treatment, even though they're full-time colleagues, essentially. Earlier this year, those contractors outnumber direct employees for the first time in companies, the company's history, more than half, accounting for more than half of the labor force. This, according to our Bloomberg reporting, here to discuss further, Bloomberg's Josh Idelson, um, one of the reporters who broke this story. So, first of all, walk us through the numbers here. More than half, and what are they actually doing? So, people are working at Google without being legally employed by Google and doing everything from writing code to managing a whole team to doing security work to cleaning the building to Well, driving. they're legally employed. They're just not full time Google employees, right? Right. I mean, many it's all of, legal. Many of the people that Google talks about as TVCs are employed, but they're employed by an outside company. They're what we would call subcontracted workers. So they have, for example, the minimum wage. They have, theoretically, the ability to unionize, but they would be unionizing to bargain with this outside company, not with Google itself. So Google is a business here, right? You know, they're trying to, they have a bottom line just like everybody else. Should we expect them 
to, to be more generous than other companies? Should we expect them not to employ so many contractors? Well, what Google would say is that they have an expectation that everybody in their community gets treated with care and respect and they have a supplier code of conduct and they're able to ramp up and down the people working on particular projects by having this. But what you found that employees didn't feel cared for, right? Many of the people we talked to, they said things like, you're there, but you're not there. Mm -hmm. They said having the status of not being a Google employee affects everything from whether you get decent benefits to getting kicked out of the room before they serve booze before a meeting mm. to having to spend a bunch of your day tagging your work, meaning documenting in detail what you're doing so they could slot you out and put in someone else. We talked to someone who said once an executive sat down with them to talk about their five-year plan for career development and then came back the next day and apologized and said, I didn't realize you were not a Google employee. Please forget that conversation ever happened. Now, you talk about in your story how this is indicative of the broader future of work or the fissure of work, as you call it. What does that mean? That's right. This trend of fissured work, it means in all kinds of jobs, people are doing work that creates a lot of wealth for a well-known company, but they're not getting their paycheck from that company. Everybody from franchised fast food workers to someone working for a contract company in a warehouse for Walmart or Uber Amazon. Uber drivers. Uber drivers, who Uber says are not employees of Uber. And what this means is these workers aren't entitled to the same opportunity to bargain collectively with that company. It means the company doesn't have the responsibility for things like payroll tax or a sexual harassment lawsuit, for example, that it would as the legal employer of those workers. And it's a trend, I like to call it the who's the boss problem. Mm -hmm. But this fissuring, we're seeing it all kinds of areas of the economy. All right, uh, Josh Adelson, great story from you, a trend I know you'll continue to follow for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, returning to our top story of the day, Facebook out with a lot less than impressive second quarter results, shares plunging after hours. However, there was a bright spot in the numbers, and that is Instagram. On the earnings call, Zuckerberg said Instagram grew almost twice as quickly as it could have on its own. Take a listen. This is a moment to reflect on how this acquisition has been an amazing success. When Instagram joined us, the team had only 16 people. And since then, Kevin and the team have built Stories, Direct, and now IGTV. This has been a story of great innovation and product execution. And it's also a story of how effective the integration has been. Here with us now, Bloomberg Tech Sarah Fryer, who uh, was on the, the earnings call, covers all things Facebook and Instagram. And I wonder, Sarah, if Mark has to convince Kevin Systrom, uh, the CEO of Instagram on a daily basis, why <laughs> selling to Facebook for a billion dollars was indeed the right call. I don't know how he came up with that twice as fast number. Certainly, Facebook has been crucial to Instagram's infrastructure, especially in terms of international expansion. And, and now I think it's clear, based on, on the people we've talked to, that, that Facebook is going to be a lot more reliant on Instagram for its future growth, especially as we've seen in this quarterly earnings that uh, you know user growth is, is stagnating or, or slowing in some areas. Now, looking at uh, the way shares are, are trading right now, all of Facebook stock gains year to date would be wiped out after the after hours move um, we are seeing at the moment. You know, they missed, but it wasn't a huge miss. Is this warranted? You know what, this is just incredible because Facebook stock does not move like this after earnings. In fact, they don't miss like this ever. I mean, this is the first time they've missed on revenue since 2015. And to compound that, that sort of uncertainty over, over that miss, CEO David Weiner on the call said that you should expect the company's revenue to decelerate further in the third and fourth quarter. Revenue will decline in high single digits uh, from the sequential quarter, and so that is has been really weighing on people. He also said margins, uh, operating margins over time are going to trend into the 30% range, which is much lower than people have predicted them to be. So a lot of analysts are going to have to rethink their models. This, this is, you know, it's an enormous advertising engine, but it can't grow forever. And I think Wall Street is sort of coming to terms with that idea. So, Sarah, look, what are the other interesting uh, tidbits that you would pull out here? You know, Zuckerberg gave a new number for 
all of the people who access any Facebook app, you know, one of the family of Facebook apps, sort of trying to push this idea that Facebook isn't just Facebook, it is a much um, broader company. And we're also getting these, uh, you know, trickles of, of, of information about why. But, you know, how much of this, as far as we can tell, has to do with these scandals, has to do about user trust, has to do with Facebook fatigue? Facebook needs to walk a fine line here because they need to convince the public that they deeply care about solving their issues with not just uh, election interference by foreign entities, but also fake news, also violence that's spurred by misinformation that's shared on the platform, also their confusing content policies, their data privacy scandals, we didn't even get to that. I mean, this is a quarter in which Zuckerberg had to testify for 10 hours in front of Congress. So they need to say, look, we're on that. But they also need to give people a little bit of hope for the future of Facebook, not being so dependent on what they call internally the big blue app, not so dependent on Facebook itself. So even as you know, Facebook may be growing a lot more slowly, maybe even declining like we saw in Europe this quarter, uh, they still have plenty of other places to draw from. One of them is Instagram, but they also have WhatsApp and Messenger, which both, which both have more than a billion users. Zuckerberg on the call mentioned virtual reality. All three of those business models are, are less mature. Uh, I would say even Instagram is less mature than Facebook. So they're going to have to really ramp up investment in those properties to make sure that they can can tell this growth story for a long time. Over this quarter, we also saw some executive reshuffling, which doesn't happen often at Facebook. Chris Cox taking on new responsibilities, LA Trade, the head of communications, um, and Colin Stretch, the top lawyer, stepping down. Uh, Sarah Fryer, who covers Facebook for Bloomberg Tech, as always, thank you so much. Um, taking a look at Facebook after hours now, the stock still diving, now down more than 23% on the back of these disappointing earnings. Facebook missing across the board on ad revenue, on mobile ad revenue, on monthly and daily active users. We'll have much more earnings to come this week. But that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Lots more Amazon and more up next. Also Twitter on Friday. That's all for now. I'm Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg.